Hi, and welcome to GetSoulStrong.com. This is another gear class with your host, Rabbi David Etz. What do we have here? Mr. Clark, are you here? I am here present. All right. For those watching on YouTube, I apologize for the delay and lag time between me and Mike. Um, we've just moved offices, thank God. And I'm back to a big open space. I'm out of my closet. And unfortunately, I'm on Wi-Fi until hot comes to connect my internet. Internet. and uh, it's not exactly the most swift thing for live conferencing so I believe there's a slight lag and that'll be fixed as soon as I get hot out here to switch out the internet so otherwise we're in our new digs it's big big it's spacious thanks to my daughter Zohari for sharing the room with Ruvain um, I'm tired of you know they, they want to be together anyways so now Avigail and I have a nice office and it's good to be back and just to let everyone know again you know, Mike, you and I have talked about where I've been, and I oh, love yeah. to do this meditation. I don't mind. Um, yeah, you know, I, I love the, the the question of where have you been, where have we come from, you know, what happened. I love to go forward and backward in my mind and in time, because uh, so many times that question is permanent. It's like almost like how do we get here? You know, where are we at? We're turning the corner into February, and I'm saying, wow, right? We're, we're six months in Jerusalem. What does that even look like? Right. How in the world has six months gone by? It looks like this. Again, I, I love to do this meditation. It goes back all the way to Cape Town of 18. It goes that far back. Um, Cape Town of 18. Even, even that is a is a tail end of the what I call the Bloom and Steel Wars. Of you know, putting out the dossier, um, basically defending my name against the tax and there was a, 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 a time period where Noah Hyde got a little bit rough and that was at the end of 17 right so Jacques and Russell are all coming to Israel in November 17 and the dossier got put out October of 17 um, and that was like the high holidays turn the corner into 18 I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Cape Town in March, and at that time I'm worn out. It's just you know the end of a very very long fight. My my weight is officially out of control, and by the now we're going to get to Texas in May June of eighteen. I don't I don't even remember that those trips being so close together in time. That's why the meditation is hard, but I guess it was. And in Texas of eighteen, I'm going to turn forty, and. Somehow, as I was talking to James Gosnell last night, he was there with me in Pittsburgh for my 40th birthday. And I guess I was, it was interesting. Was, I, I kind of believed that I was going to go on this journey. And James said, you know, he wanted to see if I, I would do it on my own. He didn't want to like encourage me like, hey man, you're going to do it. And you know, it's, it's, it's hype and false hope. And so that's when this last round started. Obviously the diet's going to start in July. And I'm going to lose about 10 kilos. It was a month, July, August, September, October, November, December. That's called teaching at 3.30 in the morning. So I'm getting real tight, real focused, and now we're going to turn into January. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to – six months later, there's your magic six months, right? Everything that I teach, I preach that it takes six months to really change your life. Right. Mike, would you say it's a fair assessment from your GSA journey? Yeah? From my experience, Yes. It takes six months. I mean, I've taught that for a long time. And what, how, what, what do you answer to people that say, well, I, I've been on there for two years. I haven't grown. I haven't gotten anything out of it. I've been there for two years, year and a half. What do you want? I haven't seen anything. They haven't applied themselves. No, those people are not coming to class every day. You know, it's right. like, again, you know, I love to give my analogy, whether it's with re wrestling, weight loss, football. Analogies work. And why do they work? Because it's wisdom. If you have a calorie deficit every other day, will you lose weight? No. No. No, you're called erratic and you're not consistent. And not only will you not lose weight, you will struggle. You struggle with everything. It'll be frustrating. And so when I when I went to yeshiva when I was a kid, 
I was on a seven year plan because I was told, told you cannot be a rabbi teaching unless you put in at least seven years of yeshiva. So guess what day one was? <clears throat> day one was day one of seven years. And at the end of those seven years, I called my rabbi in Cleveland and said, thank you for the advice. I just took in seven years today. I can now officially teach according to you. And nobody's going to go to yeshiva for seven years. Most people are not thinking that. I Bye. did. If you, if you get the prescription, you follow the advice, it works. That's wisdom. Follow the instructions. It works. Why do I use weight loss as an analogy? Because it's a prescription and it works. It's just a clear example of such a concept. Now, so now by February, I'm meeting Avigail. Didn't intend on it. No intentions of that. Now I'm running to Jerusalem dating February, March, engaged in April. Cape Town in May, marriage in June, fix, figuring out where I'm going to live in July, August, Jerusalem, September, pre, uh, you know, basically becoming pregnant, October, R Romania, uh, um, honeymoon, November, laid up in bed with surgery, December, get ready for my conference in Houston, January, post Houston. Uh, new change of staff, getting ready for my personal trainer course, and uh, moving offices and reinventing the wheel, so to speak, getting the gear content back on track. Why am I saying the gear content back on track? Where did you see in that timeline that I had spare time and luxury? Not to say the classes stopped. Ah, they didn't. In fact, you could say you could argue I taught more in those th that, that those months than ever. It's just now we have momentum teaching. That's the difference. There's there's teaching to stay on top of it. Like in, when you cut weight, you have to maintain your strength. That's, that's the secret of cutting weight. It's very easy to cut weight and starve yourself, but how do you maintain your strength? Right. So we were maintaining our strength. Now we're done cutting. We're back to bulking. We're bulking. And that's where we're at. When you're cutting, you're, 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 you're hanging on to what you have. And the cutting era is over. And now we're going to go and get strong. Get so strong. Makes sense. So that explains you the timeline, right? Going all the way back as far as 17. Figure two years. And that's where we're at. So it's now 530 in the morning. It's real time here with Mike Clark. And this uh, this latest round of the gear sugya is going to take us into Sheetuf. Because I'm finding that everybody in the the uh, call it the Noahide gear world. Uh, and Mike, is there a way to uh, can you mute your mic when you're not on so we can get a clean yes, sir, I can right now. Whenever you have time in or ask a question, remember unmute your mic, on and mute your mic. You can always uh, communicate with me in the chat box. Now, what I'm finding in the gear world is the controversy. Remember the, 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 I don't want to call it opposition anymore because it evolved evolved out of the concept of opposition. <clears throat> and I'm working with people in this one that only want to understand the truth. So it's not so much an opposition. It's more about how do you say it? It's points of unclarity. Right? The unclear point in the subject. And they're not investing in the subject for 10 years to say it was not in. And therefore, you can't expect them to I just have it uh, so clear in their minds. And I'm not saying it's necessarily clear in my mind. I mean, I think it is. But I don't know if they think that, and I don't know if they have to think that, or if they owe me that. But if we're going to discuss it, and I believe it's clear in my mind, where is it not clear, admittedly, in their minds? And that is, a Noahide takes on seven laws. Mike, would you agree with that? The, the, the baseline is going to be seven laws. You can feel free to type your answers rather than mute your mic, or you can unmute your mic. All right, we got a one on that. One is always confirmation, two is negative. 
So the seven laws are the benchmark. We always start the discussion with seven laws. It's an immutable force. Anything, non-Jew, no hide gear, especially gear. Your benchmark is not how much Torah do we learn and how much Shabbos do we keep. That is not step one. Step one is seven laws. Is that clear? In fact, is that crystal clear? It's a one. In the seven laws, I'm, I'm pretty sure one of those seven laws is to not serve through a Vodizora. Would you confirm that for me, please? We're going to be super clear and crystal clear on these points. So there's no Avodah Now, why am I emphasizing Avodah when I can say, is there a law speaking about limb of a living animal, stealing, etc.? Why am I focusing on Avodah Because the lowest common denominator of that which is a Gentile, it's a it's a real Gentile versus one who is on his way out of being a Gentile, as outlined in the Torah, is are you an idolater or not? What is a Nachri? Nachri, in the Chumash terminology, is an idolater. And therefore, if I'm a non-idolater, I have renounced idolatry. Technically, by the Chumash terminology, I am no longer a Nachri. The nation of Israel was brought out to be a non-idolatrous nation. We are not Nachri. Ostensibly, in the Chumash, in a, a ger, ger in your gates is a non-idolater. You give the meat to the ger in your gates and you sell it to the Nachri. Now, why that concept was lost in people's minds rabbinically, I don't have an answer for that. Why there's not the, a consciousness of coming out of idolatry, calling it gear, etc. Now, I will argue rabbinically that is the, me, the prescription. Why that's not clear, again, I don't know. Although I do know most people don't view the Chumash in, the, in, these way, in this way. But when you get into the Nachri and the Ger and the Chumash, that is the dichotomy. So now I'm a non-idolater. I'm a Ger in your gate in the Chumash. I've given up idolatry. When we get into the Talmud of Odazorah 64b, Rabbi Meir's opinion, what is a Ger Toshav? One who has given up idolatry in front of three of Aaron. And The question is, what does Rabbi Meir mean? Does he mean I am a ger toshav in that I'm not an idolater? Well, that would should be a good shot, wouldn't it? If we're gonna, if Rabbi Meir speaking from the Chumash point of view, right? From the Chumash point of view, what is a ger toshav a non-idolater? That's one example. Is he speaking about like the Ishmaelite level of ger toshav? As an Ishmaelite Muslim, we rule with Fipshuto that the religion is not idolatrous. Therefore, on the lowest common denominator, even though he's still an Akum, a non-Jew, he's not a typical idolatrous non-Jew. Therefore, Gir Tosha. Or we have a mayor speaking about Shituf. That yeah, I keep the seven laws, and I and I have a special emphasis on really not being an idolater, and therefore it's Shituf in front of three Khaver. We're not sure the Kavan of Rabbi Mayor. We are sure you can apply any one of those pshatim to Rabbi Meir. We know that. But nobody can go on record as saying, I know the secret Masora of Rabbi Meir. I know what Rabbi Meir meant. We know what Rabbi Meir could mean. And there are those that are a fourth opinion. Well, it doesn't even matter because we don't pass like Rabbi Meir. It doesn't even matter. Why are you even looking at Rabbi Meir, they'll say. And I will argue you must look at Rabbi Meir. Rashi mentions the sheet of Rabbi Meir. Rishona mentioned the sheet of Rabbi Meir. Everybody's always involved in Rabbi Meir, even on a theoretical level. But Halacha Lamaisa, it's Chachamim, the second of the three opinions, seven laws, which includes obviously idolatry. Most will, will agree and write explicitly that the rabbis. We're saying 
of Yimir's highlighted three of Yerim is present in their Shita of accepting the seven laws, which is called Bala. So what is a, a Ger Tosha? Somebody with Kabbalah in front of three, Gimel Chaveirim, on the seven laws. And we may add that included in Avodah Zarah is Shituf. So when I do my Kabbalah, I have rejected Shituf. It's implicit in my rejection of Avodah Zarah. In the third opinion, which is Achimim Amrim, others say, it's that I have taken on the whole Torah in, in construct, except I don't eat Vela. Now, I have gone through that teaching, you, Mike, and also in, in Houston. I believe that there are creative ways to understand that opinion because it does not seem clear that that opinion is suggesting I, the Gir Toshav, A, I eat Nevela, B, I take on every other precept of the Torah. I don't think it's encouraging. I'm in an almost convert. That I take on 612, my 613th, where you, the convert, reject Vela, that is your conversion. My Ger conversion, so to speak, is that I remain eating the Vela. But the Chavetz Chaim, the Biyar Halakha, the Theo 4, which is the Ger Toshav and Hilcha Shabbos, Seems to suggest, quoting the Magin Avraham, commentary of the Shulchan Aruch, that I, your hard worker, take on the mitzvahs of a slave, even though not a slave, essentially say, uh, saying, my Kabbalah has much more than seven. And the question is, is there such a Kabbalah? Is there a Kabbalah of more than seven? Because the Rambam doesn't seem to mention that, at least not explicitly, says Rav Moshe Feinstein. On that Bior Halacha, which is written by the Chavetz Chaim, about 100 years ago. Now, because it's written in a way you can't understand it that way, it's called the Fib Shuto. Because it's written as such, I must entertain it as such. But on, on a deeper shot, do I think that's what it's meaning as a 1A position? I don't. I think it's emphasizing that the convert says, I'll take on 613 by rejecting the Vela. I mean, that last little dot, I either fix in my own a service of God, saying, I take it on and I, I dafka don't eat the Vela. The Ger Toshav says, take, superimpose that in a whole construct of taking on the whole Torah, except for Nevela, that's me. No matter what I do, I still eat the veil. So there, there are many ways to understand Acher Mamrim. In the Nafkamina, the practical outcome is in a Kabbalah, let's say ostensibly of seven, it's a question of whether or not I have explicitly rejected Chituf. I go before Gimel Chaveirim, I'm Gir Toshav. In my Kabbalah, can I, is, is it, am I taking on more than seven? Where if I took on Shabbos, I'd have to keep Shabbos like a Jew. And that's where it's controversial. What does he mean by taking on more than seven in his Kabbalah, the Nafkamina? If I take on Shabbos, I must keep it like a Jew. Yet we're told a non-Jew that keeps Shabbos is Chayv Misa. That's why I don't think that opinion is encouraging more than seven Kabbalah. I think it is emphasizing not eating the Vela. But we know that the Kabbalah works if he does do it. So I don't think that opinion is saying, hey, go out and take on as much as you can. I think it's lowest common denominator taking on, hey, I just, I, I've given up Nevela. Which the concept of giving up Nevela is attached to all 16, because the converse says, I take on everything, even not eating Nevela. It's a concept of called taking on everything but Nevela. So I'm not saying that the, the, it's, it's no hag. Accustomed to take on all except for Nevela. I don't think that's the Iker way of reading that sheet. But I, I, I obviously you must read it that way, Betty Evid, in a less ideal way. Right? Lechachila, we're not taking on all 6 to 12. Betty Evid, it looks like you can, according to the B.R. Halacha. Moshe Feinstein says, I don't think so.
And that's the question. How do you read a Chiyom Rim? It's a question. Well, you don't even pass in that way. But we do know there's a halacha to give Nevela to this non-idolater, even today. The, the Torah calls them gay on your gates. That halacha exists today. It's not limited to the state of Israel, the land of Israel, the time of Jubilee. Ramban has it as a mitzvah deraisa of the 613 to give Nevela to the Ger. The Rambam has it listed under give uh, goods to the, the poor. And it is absolutely forbidden to give a gift to an idolater or someone labeled an idolater, which is the Nachri of today. So now in the, the halacha of, the, of Chachamim, seven laws, the question that boils all that all this boils down to is how do we understand the Vodazor at 64b, the three opinions, namely Shitu? And the first two halachas work off each other, the mayor and the rabbis. Is Shituf different and separate from seven, i.e. Vodazor? Is it an additional rejection? And there's a phrase being spread around. Are B'nai Noach warned or cautioned on Shituf? Is Shituf one uh, part of the seven? Or is it additional? And there's a, min, a, a mini sugya in, in the Shituf thing. And that's where this latest round of gear series is going to focus on the Shituf discussion. Because where the rubber meets the road with Gare is I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, let's just let's go through the progression. I'm a Noah, I'm a I'm a Nachri. I have one mic, we're Nachris. We are Christian, we are idolatrous, right? We uh, we're in that world. Are you with me? One or two. Are you with me, one or two? And we Want to leave the church. We have a chush to leave the church. We are now, let's say we are non-serious Christians. Um, we have the din of an, Avodaz, of an Ovid of Odazara. We're treated like idolaters. Even though most will agree we're not pure idolaters, we're treated as idolaters, and you can call me a Nachri or an Akram or an Eno Yehudi or a kuti, all these terms. That's who we are. Now we're going to totally leave the church, and we're kind of in no man's land searching for the truth. I believe in Hashem and Torah. That, to me, is the Iker Noahide. One or two. I'm a nice Noahide. I've left the church. I don't want JC in my life. I have come to the awareness of Hashem, the Jewish people, land of Israel. I'm a Noahide. I want. And now I'm learning the seven laws. I don't want to get back into the trap of my previous thinking. I'm probably a little bit um, queasy on uh, Kabbalistic teachings because I don't want to become an evangelical again and goofy mysticism. So I'm a bit rigid. Again, you know, I like to bring in diet um, analogies. When I was losing weight, I was extremely rigid. I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know which foods were okay. I had no freedom. I was extremely rigid in terms of my variety of food and, and my uh, freedom in food. Now that I've expanded beyond, I'm, not, I'm no longer rigid. I'm a free soul. Analogy just works. So now I want to take a by myself. I'm going to go in my bedroom and talk to God. And I, I, I formally accept the seven on myself. So now now I'm like a, I'm a, I'm a good level Noahide. Some would argue I'm a pie from the nations. I'm a chosim almost Now I'm going to get even more serious. My, my Torah learning is, is going up. I, I want to keep the Sabbath in some kind of way. That's what I feel. And I just want to grow. I want to grow in my, in my relationship with Hashem. And deep down, I'm looking for my mazel. And in doing so, right now, as I stand, I'm a Noahide, ex-Christian, 
uh, you know, do I still have the Nachri Akum label on me? Am I a Shabbos boy? Who, who am I? Who am I in Halacha? All I know is I want to keep growing and I want, if possible, to shed the Nachri Akum label. Now, it's not about labels, I'm talking about halachic distinction. When it comes to labels, my identity is not Akum, Nachri, or Geir, or Noahide. My, my label is a human being named Bob. But I understand there is a halachic attachment or label. Where do I fall in halacha, in the Jewish world? So that now we, we fall into this category called are the B'nai Noach warned or cautioned against Shitu? Right? I have a personal acceptance of the seven laws. Which means I've rejected the Vodazar. I don't own church, so you won't find me acting idolatrously. I've taken a form of Kabbalah. And now the halacha is speaking to me. Hey, you, Bob, are you cautioned on Shitu for not? And if you want to step it back a little bit, when I was in church, I'm a good Christian and I, I do business with Jewish people. Deep shoot, right? I'm a good Christian and I have Jewish friends and we're in business. Type one. We have a, uh, a store where there's an income, and the Jew needs to know, can I go into an oath with this nachri? A nach ben noach. I'm a ben noach in that even though I'm a nachri, I'm commanded in the seven laws, I'm expected to keep them, and the, we're not going to address me in my dot, dalit tough religion, of Christianity. It's not true dot. Right? My true religion, even though I don't know it, is Ben Noachism. That's why I'm a Ben Noach. How, do, how does my religion that I'm unaware of treat me concerning Shitu? You hear the question, Mike? How does my religion that I'm unaware of treat me concerning Shitu? I go to church, my name is Bob, and obviously, even though I'm friends with Jews, in business with Jews, I'll tell you I'm not a true believer, but I'm still involved in Shituf, one or two. Now please get a confirmation, one or two here. Mike, are you with me? So, my, again, my religion is, is Ben Noachism. I don't know that yet. But everyone in the world not Jewish is commanded in Ben Noach. That's what a Ben Noach is. In a vulgar way of saying it, a non-Jew who is obliged to follow Noahism, Ben Noachism. By definition, I am, I'm quasi-Noahide even though I'm a Christian. So now I want my money back, and I want to make you swear on an oath, Bob. Do you swear to give me my $10? And Bob says, yes, in the name of Yeshu, I will give you $10. And the Talmud asks, and the Tosfus ask on this, based on the Talmud, can I, the Jew, cause Bob to swear on Yeshu to give me back my $10? And the answer is, it's, it's not considered placing a stumbling block before the blind. I, by asking for the oath, I, I kind of forced you or caused you to swear in Jesus. And Ben Noachism, or better yet, in Ben Noachism, is, for, is she too forbidden? For a Jew, it's forbidden. If you, were to, if you were to take a Jew who's a Christian and we're in business and I say, uh, Moshe, 
do you swear to give me back my ten dollars? And Moshe says, Yes, in the name of Jesus. Now I just brought a fellow Jew to sin. You can't do that. Now I don't know the halakhas inside and out of, of how she works in Judaism, and it's not my intention here. Maybe there's a leniency. I don't know. Off the cuff, it doesn't look like I can cause a Jew to swear in Shittim. The Jew is certainly not allowed to believe in Shittim or worship in Shittim. The question is, I am going to cause Bob to swear in Jesus' name because I made him take an oath. He's going to mention the name of his God. Tosfus says, you know what? You can make that oath. It's not placing a stumbling block before the blind. Because deep down, Bob believes in God. Deep down in Bob's theology, Jesus is not God. You know, he may even say it, as Rav Soloveitchik explains. He may say Jesus is God, but it's a, it's a vulgar expression. He doesn't even know what that means. He believes in God. And it's a very controversial point. Does a hardcore, idolatrous, evangelical truly believe in the, you know, God, God the Father? And that Jesus the Son is not God the Father. Even though he may look at you and say Jesus is you know, God, the Spirit, and everything. Do they really mean that? Do they have enough wisdom and sequel of their own religion to you know the difference? These are all valid questions. You know, how, does, how does Catholicism work in this Tosfist versus evangelicalism, Protestantism? Protestantism? Does Tosfist differentiate between streams of Christianity or are we saying all Christianity fits the bill vis-a-vis -vis this teaching? At any rate, the Toad's Fist answer, it is not placing a stumbling block. He swore in Jesus. We say he didn't mean it. The oath is valid because B'nai Noach are not cautioned on Shittu. It's at least in terms of, at least in terms of, me, the Jew, causing you to make an oath which comes out in Jesus' name. At least in that, we know, lowest common denominator, you are not prevented from that, Mr. Bob. Now, on a, on a belief level, forget the oath and business and stumbling block for the blind, Betty Evid. Lecharchila. In my Christian service, as, as I'm a good Christian in my heart, right? I'm a good Christian, yet over me is a true religion that I'm unaware of called Noahism. I mean, truly, I am a Ben Noach. As this Ben Noach, am I allowed to have a religion of Shitu? Is the question. Certainly, it's not an issue if a Jew. Brings the Christian out in me. He didn't. He didn't commit a crime by causing me to be a Christian. But he had. Lubavitcher Rebbe would say, "Lecharchila, the Jew has a mandate to bring me out of Christianity called making garim." But he I didn't make. A, I didn't commit a crime by allowing you to perpetuate your Christianity. But in your own Dalit Amos, your own area, Bob. Can you be a Christian under B'nai Noach? Now, the opposite polar point of view, can Bob worship in Shintu? Mike, what do you think? My name is Bob, and I believe Jesus is God, and I literally bow to statues in church. And I, I worship, I believe. Is that allowed? Mike, what do you think? Can I do that under B'nai Noach law? We don't, we're not even going to address the Father. We're addressing the, you know, Jesus this, Jesus that. Mike, do you have an answer? And that's also subject to discussion. It looks to me that the overwhelming majority will say B'nai Noach law, even for this Akum unaware of B'nai Noach law. Cannot worship in Shitu. Mike, do we have a response from you? And there's a difference 
in, a, in, in terminology of Ikkerderm, between worshipping in Shituf and believing in Shituf. And yet another distinction of swearing in Shitu. And a further distinction in a Jew causing me to swear in Shitu. And yet another distinction of a Jew mandated or not to bring me out of Shitu. So there's an entire highway of Shitu from the Jew in his distant relationship with me, in his intimate relationship with me, in my relationship with God, in my intimate relationship with God, and in my superficial Christianity, where I just go around making oaths in my God's name. The, 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 the entire scope of this discussion is the sugya of Shiv. We want to explore this dictum. What does it mean that I as an Akum under B'nai Noach, law, that interfaces with Israel law, the Jew. And I caution or warned on Shituf. And it comes out as when I leave the church and I have taken on the seven laws in some form of personal Kabbalah or formal Kabbalah, is it enough to eradicate the chashash, the fear of my shitu by adhering to not serving through a vodazara? Or is there an extra emphasis on shitu? In the main commentaries on this, the Noda Yehuda, the Shava Cohen, and a few, uh, also, I guess, the Ramah, the Shulchan Aruch. And we're going to cover over the next few weeks or longer what is the truth in the Sugya of Shitu. Because the Nafgamina is as a Girtoshav, someone who has left being a Nachri, became a Noahide. And wants to become a stronger Noahide, i.e., someone mischazik, strengthened in Noahide law, so much so that I'm called Ger Toshav when I do a Kabbalah Bifne Gimel Chaveri, which makes me considered up to the pious of the nations. When I stand in that Kabbalah, is there an emphasis of Shituf? Or is it considered part of my Avodah rejection? And to, to run it back, as I stand, let's say, in the church, as a nachri under B'nai Noach law, are you expecting me to drop my sheep? Let's say as, a, as under B'nai Noach law. And if so, what does that look like? Does it look like not worshiping in Shituf, not believing in Shituf, not swearing in Shituf? All of these questions are part of this again. Now that we've understood the questions, we will explore the different points of view through rabbinic writing, and it's a rabbinic sugya. It is an entirely rabbinic sugya, because Chazal did not address it in great detail. The later rabbis did, based off of Tostas on the Gemara and Sanhedrin. That's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed. Stay with us for the discussion of, of Shituf. Uh, it'll continue. I'm not sure if it'll be on Sunday or also maybe on um, looking like Wednesday night's Israel time. But you can be sure this will continue. Have a great year. It's morning, a great evening where you are. Shalom.